Today we're solving X Factor by Philip Newman. Philip warned me when he proposed this puzzle in testing that this one is a little bit trickier than some of the diagonal Sudokus that we've posted in GAS in the past. That said, when I tested it, I thought it was really elegantly designed. And even though it might be a little bit longer than some of the other ones that we've posted, I think all of the moves and um, kind of the process of finding those moves are doable. Uh, it may just take a little bit more kind of looking and thinking and, and combining different types of reasoning to get there. So if you struggled with this one, totally respect it. I will try to be super, super clear in my walkthrough because I am aware that this one was, was designed to be a little tougher. I also think it's a really beautiful puzzle and I'll try to point out the reasons that I think that as I solve. So, this is a Sudoku, so we have to place each digit one through nine in each row, each column, and each three by three marked region exactly once each. The variant is diagonal, meaning that along each of these marked blue diagonals, digits also can't repeat, so we just have an additional restriction beyond the classic Sudoku rules. For instance, if we were to put an eight here, we couldn't put an eight anywhere else on this diagonal. We'd rule eight out of those cells, and we would rule eight out of all of these cells because that eight would actually be on both diagonals. If we were to place a three here, we couldn't put three anywhere else on this diagonal. So where I like to start with diagonal Sudoku that doesn't have any givens on the diagonals themselves is by looking at what digits are repeated in the boxes that the diagonals travel through. Because that can tell you, because every diagonal has to contain each digit exactly once, that can tell you where you're forced to put those digits. So for example, I have a four in this box and it's not on the diagonal. I have a four in this box and it's not on the diagonal. So to put a four on this downward pointing diagonal, I have to put it in this box, so it has to go in one of those two cells. I have a repeated seven here and here, so seven on the diagonal can't go in any of those cells. So to get a seven onto the diagonal, I have to put it in one of these cells, can't go here by Sudoku. So that wasn't incredibly useful, but that's the technique. And we're gonna now apply it to this positive diagonal or this kind of upward pointing diagonal, assuming you're reading from left to right. And it's going to be a little bit more productive there because here we have four, six, and seven in box five, and we also have four, six, and seven in box seven. And so we can't place a four, a six, or a seven anywhere on this upward diagonal except by putting them in these three spots in box three. And this position is already seen by a four and a six, so it must be our seven. And this is going to be a four, six pair. Now I'm glad I did that work with sevens before with the other diagonal since that seven I placed just rules seven out of this cell and now I've actually placed a seven here. My remaining two digits here have to be three and five and three already sees this cell so that's my five and that is my three. Now what else can I do with this diagonal now that I've restricted it a bit? So in this box I have a five already Therefore, the five on the diagonal has to go in one of these three cells, and it can't be this one because of the five in column three. So the five goes there or there. I have a three in this box already. So three can't go in those cells. Of course, it can't go up here. There's no room for it. So three has to go in one of those cells. And this three rules it out of this cell, so it goes here or here. The other digits that we have to place somewhere there are going to be... Um, pretty unrestricted, we're going to be able to put them in either region for now, so we have to come up with something else to do. And when in doubt, ask yourself, where are the most significant restrictions? So I've already pretty much filled in this region, and I don't see anything more I can do with it at this stage. So I'm looking at where I've placed digits. And the only other place I've placed a digit so far is up here. So let me see if there's something going on in this region. I still need four digits here. So I need a five, a six, an eight, and a nine. And this is, this is the first point where I looked at this puzzle and said, wow, this is really clever. 
I'm going to look along these rows and see if I have digits that match those. Well, I've got a 5 and a 9 right here. So 5 and 9 can't go there or there, so 5 and 9 have to go in those two positions. But the 5 in this column makes this a 9, and that's now a 5. My remaining two digits are 6 and 8. This is the second point where I said, OK, this is very clever, because that 5 I placed is immediately useful by going back to something I did really early, where I pencil marked these two positions for 5 along this diagonal. So this 5 rules 5 out of this cell, and now I've placed a 5. And this is interesting because this is kind of an echo of the deductions I made up here. What am I going to do with these cells? Well, they have to contain 1, 2, 8, and 9. Those are my remaining digits. Well, 2 and 9 can't be in this column in this region because they're already there. So that's 1 and 8. And then these 8s and this 1 down here resolve that. So now these can't be 1 or 8. So that is a 2, 9 pair. I don't think I immediately get this cell. But let's, let's hang on to that thought for now. So we just placed this 8, and that does resolve the 6, 8 pair here. The diagonal here is now restricted enough that I feel comfortable pencil marking in the rest of the digits just to see if there's anything that's more restricted than it looks at first glance, because I've used a 1, a 4, a 5, a 6, and a 7. So I still need a 2, a 3, an 8, and a 9. OK, what else does that tell me? So I'm noticing now that along this diagonal, I have some digits that can no longer really fit up here, but are also forced off of this part of the diagonal by the givens here. And what I'm looking at specifically is the 8 and the 9. So 8 and 9 can't go on these cells. They obviously can't go on these cells since those are already full. So 8 and 9, to get them onto this diagonal, have to be somewhere in these three cells. That means I can rule 8 and 9 out of these two cells, because we know they have to be in these three. So this isn't an 8 or a 9, therefore it's a 2. This isn't a 9, therefore it's a 3. This 2 is going to make this cell a 9, and that's going to make this an 8. And my remaining two digits are going to be 1 and 9. So now I know exactly what three digits go along the diagonal in box 9, because I've already used 1 and 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. That leaves me with only 2, 3, and 4. 2 and 3 see this cell, so that's a 4. This is now a 3, because a 2 sees it. And this is now a 2. And my two remaining digits for this region are going to be 5 and 6. And by the way, I know I'm saying region and box interchangeably. I actually prefer the terminology region just because, especially with people who are very new, saying box can be slightly ambiguous because it's not immediately clear, unless you're kind of familiar with Sudoku terminology, whether that means a single cell or whether it means a 3x3 three three of cells. Whereas region, not only is totally clear that it's a group of cells, but is also useful terminology for things like irregular Sudoku, where it's not a box shape, it can be wiggly. That said, saying box is pretty deeply ingrained in me, <laughs> um, so please forgive me for kind of using them going back and forth. Um, I don't think that it's a big issue, but it is something I catch myself doing. So I filled those in by Sudoku. Now I have some rows and columns that are becoming very restricted. I only need a 1 and 2 here. I only need a 3 and a 7 here. And I can place those because there's a 7 there already. Here I need a 5 and a 9, which I can't definitively place. And here I also need a 1 and a 2, which I can't quite place. So whenever I'm at this stage where I have just pretty much just classic Sudoku techniques to use to finish up, and where I have big chunks of empty space in the grid remaining, I'm going to start looking for digits that are duplicated. And two things jump out at me, these duplicated 8s and these duplicated 5s. The 8s are going to see this part of this region, and this 8 is going to chime in and see this cell. So the only cell that can have an 8 here is this one. So that is a hidden 8. 
Now I still need to place a six and a seven in this row. And the seven in this column is gonna rule seven out of that cell. So that's a six and this is a seven. Let's see if we can do the same thing with the fives. So these fives see almost all of this region and this five sees the remaining cell. And I think this is very kind of um, elegantly done to have just kind of a theme or like the echo of a theme this late in the solve. I think that's really charming. Um, it's nice when something kind of uh, continues to have like a distinctive theme or a feel to it all the way through the end. So I need a four and an eight in this column. The eight rules eight out of that cell. And there we are. So now I have another duplicated pair of digits. I have these sevens and I also have these sixes. So the sixes are going to force a six into this cell since six can't be there. And the sevens are going to put a seven into this cell. And my remaining digits here are a one, two pair and a three, four pair. And pencil mark checker is letting me know that I have failed to see a two up here. So that's a one now and that's a two. This four makes this a three and makes this a four. The two I just placed is going to resolve this one, two pair. And the one I just placed is going to resolve my one and nine from very early on. The nine gives us a five and a nine here. My three remaining digits here are four, five, and nine. And because all of these columns are almost completely full, we can go ahead and fill them in. So now I need three, seven, and nine. Three and seven see this cell, so this is a nine. Seven sees this cell, so this is a three and a seven. Here I need two, eight, and nine. I have an eight and a nine already here, so that's a two. The eight makes this a nine, and that's my eight. That resolves the one, two. This is now a six. My one has to go here because of the one in this column, and that is a four. And that's how you solve Philip's x-factor.